When it comes to analyzing a self-defense case, it's all about reasonableness. What does that even mean? Stay tuned. This is attorney Andy Markentel and attorney Mark J. Victor. We're the partners of the Attorneys for Freedom Law Firm here today to talk about an incredibly important concept in what we do as self-defense lawyers, reasonableness. How you doing, Mark? I am always great, Andy. Reasonableness. You can't overstate how important that word is. It's the whole ball of wax. It's everything. It's the whole enchilada, as everything, the saying goes. Everything. You know, when I talk about this concept, as I've been doing for pushing three decades now, talking about this to the gun community, what I like to say to them on this point is sort of imagine that the judge at a trial turns to the jury after the close of all evidence and says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you know, you've now heard all the witnesses, you've now seen all the evidence, everything that there is to know about this case, you now know. We need an answer from you really on one question. Is what the defendant did, given everything you know about this case, all the facts and circumstances and everything you know about it, is it reasonable? Because if it is reasonable, the defendant goes home. That's a not guilty. If it's not reasonable, well, the defendant's probably going to serve a long time in prison. That's right. That's really what we that's want the really jury. That's really the only that's question. It. That's all. That's the only question in a self-defense case. Was it reasonable? And you're also asking, you know, when you ask us, uh, hey, Mark, hey, Andy, is this a legitimate use of self-defense? This happened, this happened, this happened. Tell me what the answer is. The way I hear that as an experienced criminal defense lawyer is, Mark, I'm asking you to predict for me what a randomly selected group of citizens in the relevant local community is going to think is reasonable. That's right. That's it. It's a prediction about what's reasonable. So I think it's important for people who are firearms owners, people who are interested in self-defense, people who are pro 2A, you got to understand what reasonableness is about. Yeah, whenever you hear lawyers or people on YouTube or people, armchair scholars or whatever it may be, talking about, was this a good shoot? Was this a good shoot? Can you do this? Can you use your firearm in this situation? All we're talking about is reasonableness. That's it. That's uh, everything it. else aims towards reasonableness, okay? Reasonableness isn't an element per se. It's what everything kind of aims towards. So when we're t you hear us talking about something like imminency, was the threat imminent? When you hear us talking about was it proportionate to the threat that you were facing? All of these are subsets of that big question, was it reasonable? Yeah, I like to tell people that what happens is sometimes the legislature – tells the judge what we've determined in advance is reasonable, right? These are where the jury instructions come from, the statutes. In all cases, the legislature tells the judge in the case, if it isn't imminent, the threat to which you acted in response against, if that threat wasn't imminent, it isn't reasonable. That's a bright line Period. rule. Bright yeah, line it's got to be imminent. If it isn't imminent, it isn't reasonable. So somebody says... I'm going to kick your butt as soon as I get back from the bathroom. I'll kick your butt in two minutes. Two so. minutes. Okay, that's not imminent. you got to wait two minutes. You really do. I know that's crazy, and that's sort of an extreme example. You might right? flee uh, in that time and, and practice avoidance of that particular threat, but we'll talk about Imminence that. Imminence is it's upon you right now. Another rule that comes up in almost all states, right? We always talk about Texas as the exception to this rule. But if you are using deadly physical force to protect property, we're going to let you know up front that ain't reasonable. Sorry, that's not reasonable with, with the one exception of, and I don't think it's a very broad exception, by the way. I think it would be too broad to say you can use deadly physical force anytime you want in Texas to protect against property. That's not accurate. Okay, there's a statute and it's pretty clear and it circumscribes the times. But I think it's it's safe to say in almost all places, right, in at least 49 states, if you are using deadly physical force to protect property, you are acting unreasonably. They're telling you that in advance. Just another one of these sort of off-the-rack rules that come to juries and jury instructions. If you are using self-defense against words alone, it's just words. Somebody said something. No matter how offensive it is, 
you're acting unreasonable. This is the mere words doctrine, and it's one of the very first things that all lawyers learn in law school. It's like, oh, you know, words alone are not enough. Now, there are some modifiers to this rule yeah. because, as courts have found, uh, words plus corresponding action may be enough for a self-defense. So I'm going to beat you up, and man, maybe that's not enough, but I'm going to beat you up while approaching you with raised clutched fist and closing in on you now we have words plus corresponding action that may be enough to justify yeah, and it. E- even even other things right you're a fan of the team that i hate i hate fans like you you guys are a bunch of this that and the next thing okay that's not going to be enough but if the same person says the same thing and is approaching and has got fists like this and they're bigger and they're intimidating you start adding conduct along with those words, okay, that now might be a legitimate use of self-defense to protect against that threat. But just to make this point really clear, I've had many, many clients over the years uh, in my office that were charged with all manner of assault cases from very, very serious gun cases all the way down to dinky little misdemeanors, domestic violence types of disputes, uh, fights with strangers at bars, things like that. And I have heard on so many occasions But Andy, even though I punched that person first, he provoked me. He said a really, really rude, mean thing. That's good enough, right, for me to like slap him or punch him, and I have to explain the mere words doctrine. So it's this is one of those bright line rules. And while we're on the subject of bright line rules, another one is that the force that you use must be proportionate another good one to too. the force that you are facing. Okay, so general rule here, you can't use deadly physical force, so a gun, a knife, something like that that has the high high probability of causing serious physical injury or death. You can't use that when you're facing merely ordinary force. So fists, you hear prosecutors say, ladies and gentlemen, he he brought a gun to a fist fight or something like that. Now, once again, a clever attorney can make some good arguments here. And this has to do, you might make an argument uh, talking about the particular characteristics of the defendant. Maybe they're an old, decrepit woman such that uh, ordinary physical force is enough and is, in fact, proportionate to deadly physical force because just a a punch to that particular, we might call it an eggshell defendant, to use a term of art, might actually result or high high chance of resulting in deadly physical force or serious injury. So you can make these arguments and sometimes you can also do it with how many assailants are there, right? If there's one person and they're surrounded by eight assailants that are bigger than them, well, at that point, it starts looking like, hey, even though you're using deadly physical force and they're just using fists, a clever attorney might be able to argue, no, this was proportionate use of deadly physical force because they were outnumbered in such a way. Yeah, all these points really just go to try to get at what's reasonable, right? We can't plan for every circumstance, right? You're not going to have a jury instruction that covers the specifics of the case that's going to be in front of you. So we have these general rules, right? And then things that we've been talking about, you could kind of put in the category of sort of off the rack, jury instruction kind of rules, guideposts that tell people, hey, look, this kind of thing. Uh, Like, for example, you can't use deadly physical force in response to a threat of ordinary physical force. That's your proportional argument that you were just talking about. Stuff like if you're the aggressor, right? If you started the problem, you are the aggressor, you don't get to use self-defense. Now, there are some times when you can be the aggressor and you can say, hey, look, man, I'm done. You withdraw, you communicate that fact that you've withdrawn from the conflict and now you're, you're like, I'm out. Okay, you make it clear. You can regain your right to self-defense. You legally can regain your right despite the fact that initially you were the aggressor. You know, this brings up an important point that we discussed on a recent video. They got a lot of people talking, and that was the Apple River stabbing incident that happened in Wisconsin. Um, A lot of people said, well, you know, the guy came over to the group of kids and started being aggressive with them first and harassing and everything like that. And yeah, while it's true, at the time that the kids attacked him, he was kind of putting away and wasn't really doing anything to them. He started it. Well, there's a strong argument legally that he reclaimed the right to claim self-defense, even though he came over to it at first. It was clearly over. The confrontation between him, as far as that video shows, is clearly over. He's not being aggressive with them. So, yeah, this is legally significant when you withdraw from being the initial aggressor. It all speaks to the reasonableness of the act of self-defense. Yeah, that was a really controversial point in that video, because I recall 
recall his testimony was that he sort of slipped in the river and kind of fell on that tube. Right. I watched the video. I thought that was a reasonable explanation. But even if it wasn't, right, say he's the initial aggressor. I remember some people even commenting on our video and say, hey, this guy was the initial aggressor and that's the end. Not so fast, right? Because after that, you see him very clearly walking away, certainly not being aggressive. I think it's very clear to everybody who's on scene at that point that if he was aggressive at that point, that's over. That incident has ended. Now we're in a new incident, right? Because otherwise, you become the aggressor. You're the aggressor for the rest of your life. And just to be clear, he got convicted in that case. I know this is did. one of those instances where we think the jury got it wrong. And we have a full breakdown if you guys want to check it out. Uh, link in the description. But this brings up another important part, Mark. And you alluded to it earlier, but I think it's really important to point out. Remember, everybody, that when you're asking us uh, the question of, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I shoot in this situation? As you just correctly pointed out, uh, you're asking us to predict what a hypothetical jury of randomly assembled folks in that particular jurisdiction will think is reasonable. That's a fact, because all we can do as lawyers is we can make predictions based on the black letter of the law and these types of principles we're talking about. We can read you what the statute says. We could even talk about similar cases, and we can give predictions based on that stuff. But at the end of the day, the jury has the ultimate power. The jury even has the power to ignore all of that stuff. The jury even, frankly, has the power to nullify the law, even though it's not something that we talk about a lot. Once again, we got a lot to say about that link in the description about jury nullification. But this ultimate power with the jury in determining reasonableness, we should not uh, lose sight of that ever as criminal defense attorneys, because all we can do is make predictions based on the black letter. The jury's the ultimate stopgap here. Yeah, you know, experienced criminal defense attorneys are always very tentative about what juries can do because we've seen all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, I I specifically remember a case that I tried one time. I was forced into trial. Every case I have ever lost at trial has been a situation where the client did not follow my advice and insisted on going to trial. This was a case where the client didn't follow my advice and my advice was to not go to trial. I said, there's no way we win this case. You should take the plea. This guy said, I don't care. I got a good lawyer. I'm going to trial. I said, you're being an idiot. We went to, he forced us to trial and we won. I couldn't believe that the jury came back with a not guilty. I would have bet money that they would have come back with a guilty, but they came back not guilty. I've also had the reverse. Right. We've had the situations where not just me, but the prosecutor and the judge absolutely convinced the jury was coming back with a not guilty, and they'd come back with a guilty. It has nothing to do with the black letter of the law sometimes. It has to do with the stupidity of the people on the jury. That happens, right? So sometimes, it, I think I know the case that you're referring to because we tried it together, and everybody in the courtroom was shocked. Not only the judge, the prosecutor, and both of us, but also the court reporters, the people who had been the court staff, every single person in that room would have bet money that that's, this was going to come back as a not guilty. Then as lawyers do a lot of the time, we had the opportunity to poll the jury afterwards and talk to them and chat with them about their rationale. And the reasoning that they gave for why they came back with a conviction, um, first of all, it was driven by just a few individuals in the jury. And this happens sometimes. Sometimes yeah. a strong personality rises to the top and basically starts bossing everybody around. And everybody's like, rather than argue with this jerk. I, I'll just, Sure, what gets me out of this room? I mean, not, not all jurors take their responsibilities uh, equally. Some jurors just want to go home. Some jurors don't want to serve on the jury in the first place, or uh, the trial has taken longer than uh, they expected it to. And those types of juries might be susceptible to a strong personality, for example, that rises to the top during jury negotiations such that they just want to go home and they agree with what the majority of people in the room are saying. You know, I tell people, you you know those crazy irrational people who some of some of them are your neighbors they vote for the political candidate you think's an idiot they're they're enthusiastic about that some of those people get on juries that's right that's who's going to be on your jury deciding what's reasonable and just as a footnote to that case is good lawyers do as you're going through a trial you collect good appellate issues mm -hmm. 
and oftentimes you can make a deal after even a guilty verdict. That's actually what we did in that case. Yeah. And the client gave up his right to appeal and the prosecutor gave up certain things and the sentencing went and actually resulted in a deal that was better than the plea that was initially offered before That's the right. trial. So yeah. it had a happy ending, yeah. but it was still in a in, in really instructive case about reasonableness, right? What you think is reasonable isn't necessarily what your neighbor or someone in the community thinks is reasonable. Or in this case, what all of the trained lawyers in the courtroom, including the judge, thought was reasonable is not what the folks in the jury box decided. And that's ultimately their decision. Yeah. So when you talk about reasonableness and there's all these rules and things we just talked about, just sort of general guideposts about what's reasonable, there's really two parts of the reasonableness question, right? There's the objective reasonable standard and then there's the subjective reasonable standard these are really two completely different concepts right the objective reasonable standard deals with what some pretend hypothetical reasonable person under the same circumstances would have done in that situation. We might call this the reasonable person standard. At least that's what it's oftentimes referred yeah, to. Yeah, sometimes we say reasonable and prudent, whatever is abs- you know, prudent. <laughs> prudent. This is a this is a very responsible person. What would that person do in similar circumstances? That's the ruler to which we are measuring the defendant against. Yeah, and there's an, a couple important things to say about objective reasonableness because lots of questions about this hypothetical reasonable person immediately pop up. How old are they? What's their physical stature? Uh, do they have any diseases? Uh, do they have any sort of proclivities towards this or that or the next thing? Do they have different memories or experiences that were traumatic in the past that might affect them? Things like that. And the answer to that is the reasonable person in a trial, when we're talking about objective reasonableness, they actually kind of adopt the characteristics of the defendant to a large right. degree. Whatever characteristics that the defendant has that are reasonable, the reasonable person yeah. will then adopt. But if the defendant holds unreasonable beliefs, those are not adopted by the hypothetical reasonable person. So That's it's right. kind the, of an interesting thing here. The reasonable person is cautious. Right. The reasonable person is responsible. Right. The reasonable person isn't drunk. But there are other things, right? Because you might have a 90-year-old old, a ninety-year-old lady sitting there as the defendant. It's okay. What would a reasonable 90-year-old lady, lady do under these circumstances do? Who, who has do? this height and this weight and yes. this, th- these diseases or whatever it may be, these physical proclivities, that all comes into that reasonable person's standard and in fact the judge will direct you're you're to go off a a similarly situated reasonable person yeah we don't presume that the reasonable person has specialized knowledge or specialized training or anything like that this is just sort of if you can imagine the average, we call sometimes John Q. public right. kind of a person. But let me just illustrate that other point, which is that if the defendant in the case happens to hold unreasonable beliefs under the objective standard, those are not adopted by That's the right. reasonable person. So say that same 90-year-old decrepit grandma has a pretty extreme belief that all people with blonde hair are dangerous and coming to kill her. And so when she shot that person with the blonde hair who was walking down the street and not posing and otherwise imminent threat. She did it with the uh, belief that, you know, all people with blonde hair hold this. Well, the reasonable person is only going to adopt reasonable beliefs and things like that. It's not going to take extreme positions and incorporate it in. Yeah, we do our best to sort of tweak this reasonable person to get it as close to possible as, you know, the the circumstances dictate. So, for example, if the defendant in the case knew the other person, the alleged victim, and knew that this person was a violent person, had mm-hmm. seen them in fights. Maybe the two of them got in fights before or something like that. They just witnessed this person fight somebody else or they got a reputation in the community for violence. And, and this person, the defendant, is aware of that situation. Oh, my God, this was big, bad, whatever. He's the guy on the reputation. He he beats everybody up. That's the guy I was dealing with. Then we kind of put that knowledge on the reasonable person. It's a reasonable person who knew they were dealing with this kind of a person who had that propensity for violence. And we talk about this all the time in our uh, various shooting videos, uh, our analysis of these videos, and people who watch this channel will know. Um, we'll all often add a footnote in there where it's like, all right, so at this point, you know, he fires the gun. Now, 
maybe he knows this person and knows that they beat up his friend or beat up his wife before or something like this. And if he knows that, then it becomes relevant in that reasonableness factor. But then there are other, like, for example, high pro, uh, to pick a high profile example, the Kyle Rittenhouse case, um, a lot of the media um, That's right. That's ma- made much one. ado about uh, all of the prior convictions and all of the right. dangerous things that the, vi- the victims, right. the, the alleged, alleged victims. victims, as they were called, all the horrible, violent things that they had done in their past. Well, Even the gun community made a big deal with this. Made a huge deal about yes, it. Yes, the, the child molester who attacked Mr. Rittenhouse or the this or the that. Yeah, the prohibited possessor, right. the violent Antifa yes. guy, all that stuff. Well, all that stuff is legally irrelevant to a reasonableness analysis if... Kyle Rittenhouse doesn't know about it yeah. at the time, and right? And he clearly didn't know in this case. And so, and, and by the way, people can watch our analysis of the Rittenhouse video. We're plugging a lot of our other videos. Well, in this I kind. mean, this is what we Link down about. below, guys. Yeah, so check out the Rittenhouse video. We talked about this. Yeah, yeah. and in that Rittenhouse video, if I remember correctly, we talked about the stuff that Kyle Rittenhouse did see, because while all those priors and the child molestation and everything that one of the uh, people who were shot is irrelevant because Kyle didn't know about it, Kyle did see like 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes before one of those victims lighting trash cans on fire yep. and swinging a chain around and you know doing things. All that stuff is relevant in the reasonableness analysis. That's right. It, We're it, going to impute to that hypothetical reasonable person those sites that yes, he just saw. Right, and that, that makes sense if you think about it, right? Because that's relevant to what a reasonable person in that circumstance would do. Right, okay. Now we talked about uh, the reasonable person standard as kind of a prudent and sober person. And so the law draws a few bright line rules here about intoxication. And uh, there's just kind of a general rule here that voluntary in intoxication if you ch- in other words if you choose to become intoxicated that's not what we're using as our reasonable person our reasonable person in that situation is sober and so you can't say well i acted reasonably for an intoxicated right. i was a reasonable intoxicated person is never a defense yeah clients try this sometimes they come in you know i sit there in my office and they say hey look you know i had a few drinks and i you know i was drunk and so what do you you know what do you expect me to yeah, do yeah i wouldn't have punched him if i wasn't drunk come right on. And, and and i say sorry You know, the law doesn't, you know, it gives you some things, the things we've talked about, those specific circumstances, we bring those in to apply to the reasonable person. But the fact that you voluntarily drank alcohol and now you are now impaired, you get absolutely no help from that. Now, with a little caveat, right, there are some crimes we are looking at what we call specific intent, right? Think, think premeditation, something like that. Let's make an easier one. Theft. Let's say that you're drunk and you didn't intend to steal your friend's keys or something like that and you were just drunk. You didn't have the specific intent to steal that. So there are certain crimes that actually require you to think it out, plan it out, and do the thing willingly, knowingly, and uh, if you're impaired, even voluntarily, that is a defense. Yeah, so the argument, Judge, he was so drunk he couldn't form the specific intent to do that. But as a general rule, the fact that you voluntarily ingested alcohol or any other drug isn't something you get to rely on in terms of how you act. Now, I I would also contrast that with involuntary. Yeah, I was going to say we got to throw that footnote out there because people should be noticing we're using the very, very purposefully with our language calling it voluntary intoxication because while voluntary intoxication is never a defense in this respect, involuntary intoxication always can be a defense. So in other words, somebody drugged you, you took a substance or somebody forced you to take a substance or you took a substance unknowingly. Maybe you've been prescribed something by a medical professional negligently and it had an unexpected and unwanted adverse uh, reaction that's based on a few uh, real life scenarios that we've had. We have a case in our office right now And obviously we can't talk about it, but where we're asserting involuntary intoxication as a defense. And so if somebody slips something in your drink and then you do something, okay, that's a defense. Now, of course, you still got to show that the intoxication was involuntary, not voluntary. 
And if you were prescribed medication and then you took that medication in excess of what was prescribed, it's going to be considered voluntary. So I don't think a court would phrase it like this, but essentially what that means in terms of our reasonableness analysis right here is you can say, what would a reasonable, involuntarily intoxicated person do? You're going to go off of, okay, you know, if that person was drugged against their will, what can we, what standard can we really hold them to? You can use that as a defense. Yeah. And then there's this other sort of exception that this sort of hangs out there, which is this uh, battered woman syndrome or domestic violence victim. And so states have moved uh, to adopt this kind of a standard. In fact, we, we talked about this uh, in the Kayla Giles case, not to beat the dead horse in that case, but we talked about there wasn't a domestic violence expert brought in the stand. And, and the reason that's important is because if you were defending that case, if we had been defending that case, we would have wanted to argue she should be judged not by the reasonable person standard, but by the reasonable battered spouse. Domestic abuse victim. Yes. the re- What would a reasonable person who had suffered this kind of domestic abuse have done in this situation. Right. That's a legitimate argument in a self-defense case. Courts have sort of carved this exception out there. And of course, that wasn't argued in her case. And we think it should have been. And that's an issue. It's, it's so important to help a jury understand. And yeah, it, it is kind of a carved niche area that courts have historically overwhelmingly supported. Like, look, people who are victims of domestic violence, it actually does something chemically to your brain. I've talked yeah. to doctors and had doctors in as experts in some of my cases where a spouse was battered and then in, ended up doing something to uh, the spouse that had battered them. And it actually changes your brain in a way that you can objectively have a different outlook on something because of years of abuse or even, you know, a certain amount, even a smaller amount of abuse if it's impactful enough. So, yeah, it's an interesting carve out in the law there that we don't go by just the reasonable person, but the reasonable domestic abuse victim. Yeah. So that sort of fills out the objective reasonableness standard. And again, we're we're positing, we're pretending this ruler to measure against what would a a reasonably cautious, prudent, sober kind of person have done under these particular circumstances. Then there's the subjective standard. And very important to note here, um, we just spent a lot of time talking about objective. We're about to dive into subjective. You need both. You need oh, both. Not one or the other. If you want to have a reasonable act of self-defense, you need both. It's got to be objectively reasonable, which is measured by that stand, the ruler we just talked about, and then a subjectively good faith, reasonable belief. You believed you were actually in danger. So subjective is all, if you look at objective reasonableness, it's kind of out there in the external world. World, right? It's all the objective facts of what's going on. Subjective reasonableness is all about what's going on between your ears. You yep. have to subjectively hold a good faith belief that all of these different elements that would otherwise justify a, a self defense uh, uh, act uh, were there. So, in other words, you have to prove that you subjectively believed that the threat was imminent that the amount of force that you used was proportional, that you weren't merely just defending property with your deadly physical force, um, with the caveat of Texas, as we talked about, uh, that you uh, believe that you weren't just responding to mere words. All of these things, not just in the real world, it, you have to prove that it happened uh, in between your ears. And so a great example here would be that let's say that somebody was coming at you and you thought that they were coming at you with fists and you pull your firearm out and and you shoot them and you kill them and then uh, you're talking to the cops later and it turns out that the person actually had a knife and you just didn't see the knife and so other words ob- ob- under an objective standard this person's closing in with a knife on you and so you're objectively allowed to shoot them at that point that's proportionate but then you don't follow our advice to just show up and you decide to talk to the cops and you tell the cops something like yeah you know I, d- I didn't see anything in his hands or anything like that he just looks like he was coming up to beat me up and I was really scared and so I blasted him away. Well, now you've lost your subjective standard and you need both in order to have a valid act of self-defense. Another way to say it is imagine a set of circumstances where that person acted as a reasonably prudent person. It measures, it meets the objective standard, but the defendant opens his big mouth and says, 
I wasn't really afraid of the guy. Right. Oh, I've had that. In I wasn't really afraid of him. I took, several cases. I figured I had the opportunity here to, to use force in self-defense, but I wasn't actually scared. You just blew your self-defense case. Yeah, cops will ask defendants sometimes, so did you think he was going to kill you? This is, I mean, they're, they they know enough right. to ask you that. Yeah. Like, did you think he was going to kill you when you shot him? I, I, not necessarily going to kill me, but he, he looked really angry and he looked like he was coming at me. You just potentially blew your self-defense case, yeah. right, on your yep. subject. Reasonableness. Yeah, and of course, we don't yet have the technology to actually read somebody's mind. So, you know, the que- people are probably wondering, how do you figure out what's actually between the ears, what's going on? And it's really two ways here. One is from what people say, right? You might be dumb enough to say, no, I wasn't really afraid. Or you might say, I was scared as hell. I thought the guy was going to kill me. Okay, that's a good statement in terms of a subjective, reasonable belief. That's one thing. The other is what you did, right? We infer what you believed from things that you did. This is where that whole consciousness of guilt stuff comes in, right? There was that taco shop shooting that uh, came up. We did that video as well. I don't know if we want to link that one, but that one was in there. And in that video, the guy flees the scene. Right. He gets in his car and he takes off. And so a prosecutor is going to argue that what they'll call consciousness of guilt. He thought he was doing something wrong, i.e. he didn't have a subjective belief that he was acting in self-defense. That's why he took off. That's why he tried to hide the weapon. That's why he you know, did something with the witness or whatever. He consciously, re- subjectively believed that he wasn't actually acting in self-defense. That's why that evidence comes in. I mean, that came up in the Apple River case, too, because he, he chose to waive his Fifth Amendment rights to remain silent and speak to the cops, and he lied his butt off. And it made him, it was played for the jury and everything like that. And, of course, the prosecutor used that as consciousness of guilt evidence and so they'll use this type of evidence when you flee the scene when you destroy evidence when you lie to the police when you generally act in a in in, in a way that makes you look shady or like eh, you know you're not fessing up to it, you're not owning up to it this is consciousness of guilt and can be weighed by the jury during the reasonableness analysis of subjectivity yeah it's all relevant stuff so you know when i talk about reasonableness to a jury we talk about all this stuff we talk about the objective and the subject objective and all the various rules but I like to explain to them this I, I say think about it as a range think about it as a realm you know reasonable people sometimes disagree reasonable minds disagree it's possible that a reasonable prudent sober cautious person could do either this or that right and so it doesn't mean that there's only one thing to do and I explained to the jury was it was the defendant's conduct The question is not, did the person do the best thing possible? Not, did he do what you would do? What he did, is it within that range? And we, of course, want to make it a big range. I like that you bring this up because uh, another way to put it is the law does not hold you to a standard of perfection. That's right. The law holds you to a standard of reasonableness. That's right. And that's all we're asking. It's not, did you act perfectly or did you do the best thing or even did you do the right thing? Did you do the reasonable thing? This is the reason why a reasonable mistake of fact is okay. Oh, okay, yes. So I'm glad you actually brought up the taco shop case. I know we're referencing a million other videos that we've done. People should go into a little YouTube rabbit hole if they want to check out all this previous content. But the taco shop case involved a reasonable mistake of fact. The guy busts in there uh, and starts robbing everybody at gunpoint. Everybody give me your money. Starts collecting wallets, everything like that. Well, the shooter in that case, sorry, let me rephrase that the hero in that case hops up and takes his opportunity and shoots the uh, armed robber Uh, and then after he downs the threat he discovers in horror that the gun is plastic Mm -hmm. Uh, it looked like a real gun it presented like if you look at the video it it doesn't have an orange tip on it. it's not multicolored it was intended to look like a real gun he probably thinks oops i screwed up and he looks at it and and, he definitely thinks that because he chucks it at the wall and it's like oh no and then he flees the scene right he hops in his car and he leaves and everything like that well reasonable mistake of fact is implicated here and we talked about this in depth which is that if a reasonable person here we go with that reasonable person standard again if a reasonable person would have believed that that was a real gun in other words that there was an imminent threat of deadly physical force or serious physical injury then 
That mistake doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It is to throw it out that that was a fake gun. The reasonable mistake of fact doctrine, which is present in every single state's jurisdiction in the United States, would allow you to use deadly physical force if you believed it was reasonably necessary to do so, even if wrong. Yeah, I think it's a really important point, right? Because people think, oh my God, I made a mistake. But you're not judged by the actual facts. You're judged by what a reasonable person would have believed about the actual facts, right? And so, I mean, you could make a claim here and a, ju- a jury may reject it. That it wasn't reasonable that you thought this person had a gun because uh, they were wearing a blue shirt. I, I, the last time I saw a person with a blue shirt, they had a gun. I, You know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's not a reasonable belief. Sorry. But something like I saw his hand in his pocket, I saw a bulge in his pocket, then maybe there was, turned out to be a cell phone or a pack of cigarettes or something that could reasonably be misconstrued as a gun. You're in business right there. Now, people can argue about whether that was a reasonable mistake or not. That's what juries do. That's their function. But if it was a reasonable mistake then you're off the hook. And so I think it's important for people to understand that, uh, as you said, and I'm just going to highlight it again, you're not held to a standard of perfection. You're held to a standard of reasonableness. And we defense attorneys always want to make that a big, long range. What's reasonable? I don't know. This guy thinks this is reasonable. That guy thinks this is reasonable. It's true. We really do have a pretty big range. Look, some people think Donald Trump is reasonable. Some people think Joe Biden is reasonable. Some people think both are reasonable. Those are pretty broad. A lot of people think neither are reasonable. Neither are reasonable. People have different ideas about what's reasonable. And actually, reasonable minds actually can disagree about things. And so you really want to characterize a defendant in a self-defense case. All you got to do is put that person in the reasonable range. Yeah, just one more thing about the reasonable mistake of fact doctrine. I love this doctrine so much because I believe that it gets uh, the purpose of the criminal justice system right. Now, what do I mean by that? It's a great point. The the idea is that we only want to punish people with the bad intent in their head or who actually intend to do a bad thing. Now, if somebody makes a mistake mistake or something like that, um, that's something maybe to be handled in the civil realm. That's, that's right. something like maybe there's some damages or <clears throat> yes. something that they caused. But if they didn't intend to do those damages, that's what the criminal code is for. It's to punish people who had the bad things in their head. So, yeah. I mean, there's an example that we've talked about before, which is, um, you know, you could imagine that uh, you see a young lady jogging down the road and then somebody jumps out of the bushes and tackles her and you think you're being a good Samaritan and you run over and you punch the person in the face. And then it turns out she's a fleeing felon and this was a, you know, a DEA Oops. agent or Oops. something like that who lawfully had the right to seize her. You've just made a big mistake. And maybe you maybe you really even seriously injured the guy. Maybe you broke his jaw. Maybe he's permanent permanently injured for the rest of his life. The reasonable mistake of fact doctrine is so important here to say we don't want to punish the person in the criminal justice system who had the right thing in their head. If that agent wants to sue him for civil damages, that's in a different spectrum. That's on a different level, different burdens of proof involved there. Um, There are some defenses that one could reasonably assert even there, uh, but that's not the purpose of the criminal justice system. I love the reasonable mistake of fact doctrine because I think it in a very productive way, tries to sift out who belongs here in our world, right? Yeah. You know, we should also say something about presumptions because, you know, there is some areas in the world where you stand that the law says, look, you're presumed to be acting reasonably. Now, now with everything we just said about reasonableness, given that it's the whole ball of wax, if you are presumed to be acting reasonable and the jury is told, hey, ladies and gentlemen, because somebody forced their way into the defendant's home, the defendant is presumed to be acting reasonably. Like, that's big. Huge. You want that presumption. If you can get that jury instruction from the judge, you're in good shape. Incidentally, that's the presumption that Kayla Giles did not get. That's right. Because it's not just your home, it's also, in some places, your vehicle. Occupied vehicle. Or or an occupied vehicle or a business. And it's only a forcible entry. And if, if you remember from that video, it wasn't so clear from the actual video, which was grainy and from a distance, about whether he opened the door, whether he sort of forced himself in. That's, it was hard to tell from the video. And the daughter had said, you know, he was jumping at her, which made it seem more forcible. And then she took that statement back at the trial. And in the Court of Appeals decision, they specifically said that there wasn't 
evidence based on her statement at trial that the entrance was forcible, therefore no presumption of reasonableness. Yeah. Now, there are different kinds of presumptions in the law. Some are rebuttable and some are not rebuttable or irrebuttable. Before you get into examples of those, let me just talk about it generally for people who don't speak legalese, right? Because that's the purpose of this is to educate people about how these things work. Think of it like this when you're talking about presumptions. What the heck's a presumption? Because somebody might hear that and think, oh, does it mean you presume something? Something or something like that. Here's what a, pres- a legal presumption is. Imagine that the lawmakers in your state decided, you know, there are some situations where when people are weighing whether the conduct was reasonable or unreasonable, we want to put a little bit more weight on this scale over here, on this side of the scale. And what are those types of situations? Well, we think that being safe in your home is really important. We think that being safe in your car when it's occupied, when you're sitting there and somebody's trying to break it, we think that's really important. And so we're going to create laws that basically say, uh, look, the jury can still weigh out everything. They can still hear everything. They can still hear both sides of the argument from the prosecutor and the state. But we're going to put some weight on that side, on the reasonableness side, if you were in your home and somebody broke into your home. We're going to put some more weight on that side if you were in your car and somebody's breaking in. So think of it as if the legislature is just deciding areas where they think, eh, we want to put a little bit more weight towards reasonableness. Yeah, I mean, if you tell the jury in a self-defense case that the defendant is presumed to be acting reasonable, It's a rebuttable presumption, which means that the state or the government, the prosecutor, now has to present evidence to convince you otherwise. This isn't really that far, frankly, from the way that all states have the burden of proof here, right? It didn't used to be this way. Self-defense used to be an affirmative defense. So that meant that the defendant had to raise it and the defendant had to prove it by preponderance of the evidence. But now, and I think it's all states, have gone the other direction and said, once the defendant raises some evidence to, to convince the judge, okay, there's enough here for jury instruction. It's not very much. The defendant just says, essentially, I acted in self-defense. There's some scintilla of evidence there. The judge says, okay, I'll give you the jury instruction. And judges generally err on the side of giving the jury instruction because, you know, failure to give a jury instruction, if a court of appeal says, you know, you should have given the jury instruction, that's, that's reversible. definitely yeah. going to be reversible error. And, then, you know, jury instructions are a fertile ground for getting cases reversed. So it's a pretty low standard to get that jury instruction. Then the government has the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this was not self-defense. Said another way, the defendant did not act reasonably. So adding a presumption onto that to say, okay, the defendant, because there was a forcible entry into his or her home, is presumed to be acting reasonably maybe doesn't add a heck of a lot in that environment. Yeah, but Mark, this point harkens back to something we were talking about earlier, which is all all you're doing right now is talking about the black letter of the law. And yes, those of us who practice the law know that a presumption that they are presumed to have acted reasonably really isn't that far from the pre-existing fact that the state already has to prove the damn thing beyond a reasonable doubt. But in the real world, when that judge, we've been there, Mm -hmm. when that judge turns to that jury to read them the jury instructions and says, ladies and gentlemen, the defendant is presumed to have acted reasonably. It's that, so impactful. That's gold for your so impactful. for your cross examination. Yeah. You can pull that out, put it up on the screen. The judge had just instructed you for your for your closing argument. The person is presumed to be acting now. If they're acting reasonably, that's the end. Yeah. So that's a very important point to bring out there on presumptions. But most of them are rebuttable. But it's still, remember, you're dealing with people who aren't trained in the law, right? These are these are jurors who are pulled out of their lives in all different careers. Some people say these are the people who couldn't get out of jury duty, who are, who are there on your jury. Not all of them. Not all of them. But some of them. You want everything you can have, right? This is a high stakes game. And if you can get a presumption because it was a forcible entry into a home or a business or an occupied vehicle or something like that, you want that presumption. One other point I want to make before we wrap up here, too, because I think a lot of people get really excited about, you know, the castle doctrine and stand your ground and duties to retreat and all this stuff. And look, most states don't have a duty to retreat. Some of the states that are, you know, hardcore anti-gun states, think of the two coasts, uh, they have statutes that say if you can retreat in complete safety before you use deadly physical force, you must retreat. 
then they have exceptions to that. Think of that as the castle doctrine, that if your home is your castle, you don't have to retreat from your home. Uh, Many of those states will also add you don't have to retreat from your business. You don't have to retreat in some of them from your vehicle, something like that. And that's all true. But man, if you retreat, it sure makes it a lot easier for us, right? If you attempted to retreat, it makes it a lot easier for us to argue you are acting as reasonably as possible. So I always tell people, even if you're in a state, and you probably are, where you don't have a legal duty to retreat, for two reasons, it makes sense. Number one, if you can avoid the whole problem and you don't avoid the whole problem, this is really dumb. Yeah. This is really dumb. Even if you're involved in a very defensible case, you don't want to be charged with a crime. If you are charged with a homicide, even if it turns out to be completely defensible, you've already lost. You're not going to feel like a winner. I know, because I've had people who have gone through long, arduous trials, and at the end, the jury comes back. There's an acquittal. Not not guilty, and they're relieved. But you sure don't feel like, like a winner. The last couple years of oh. my life, up to a couple of years, have been hell, going through the you, stress you, and worry. And- you check your ego. If you're going to carry a firearm, check your ego. And if you can retreat, you're smart to retreat. The second reason to retreat is because it makes our job easier. If you at least tried to retreat, it's e- for us to say, look, maybe he didn't have to retreat, but he tried everything to avoid this problem. Make our job, this is why we say, look, even if you can use deadly physical force, can you use something lower? If you could have just said, look, I got a gun, leave me alone. If you could have just shown the gun, if you could have just maybe taken it out and and held it in a protective manner, not in somebody's face, maybe while you're backing up saying, leave me alone, I don't want any problems, those kinds of things, rather than... I just pulled it out and discharged around. Right. Okay, we like to see an escalation. We want to see the escalation of force, yes. This is definitely on our reasonableness wish list as criminal defense attorneys. We want to see that you did everything that you possibly could have done before you discharged that round because that lets us put more stuff on the side of reasonableness. This is where people get into trouble. People get into trouble oftentimes on proportionality. They pull a firearm out too fast. Yep. Somebody said something and bam, the firearm comes out too fast maybe there was a threat of ordinary physical force but you responded with a threat of deadly physical force little caveat here there are different defensive display statutes that different states have Uh, this is different from pointing a gun out and shooting somebody and frankly it's different than even pulling a gun out and pointing it at somebody Uh, this is maybe at the low ready maybe this is displaying it patting it gesturing to it informing somebody that you have it and in most of these states with defensive display statutes you can defensive display in response to ordinary physical force. If it's imminent, if it's proportional, all all the same things still apply. Uh, But there are certain situations where you can use your gun in a way that isn't actually exercising deadly physical force. Here's a really good piece of advice for people. Well, maybe a few things. As I said previously, check your ego. If you're excited about pulling out your firearm, you shouldn't be You shouldn't have a firearm. Right, right. Make sure you're trained. You know what the heck you're doing. We don't want to have an... An accidental discharge. That's a really serious crime. That's we get them all the time. All the time. All the they time. come in all the time. Be aware of that. Remember, just because you took the magazine out doesn't mean there's not a round in the chamber. Check it every single time. Follow the gun safety rules. All guns are loaded at all. I don't care if you just checked it. Check it again, right? And so many times we've had people in our and, office saying, I'm a responsible gun owner. You know, I've done all the training. I've done all the classes. I know how to do all this stuff. I never thought it would happen to me, but I got a negligent discharge while I was cleaning my... I just didn't check this time, and uh, I, I'm just... I never thought I'd be here. You know, and we then, see that all the time. As a general general rules, avoid the problem if you can avoid the problem, right? If you got to do verbal judo or something like that, do that if you can. If the problem's brewing, if you can get out of there safely, avoid it. And then if you can't, use the least amount of physical force or deadly physical force that is reasonably necessary to repel that imminent threat. The least amount. Don't go overboard. You, you got to act. Sometimes you have to act decisively, right? You don't have a problem. You have a right to defend yourself. But don't use more force than was reasonably necessary. Then keep your mouth shut. Keep your big mouth shut. And call your lawyer. Yeah, that's right. Um, I guess I got one more thing I want to throw out there just very briefly. We mentioned uh, a hypothetical a little bit earlier, and that has to do with defense of a third party. So while we're talking about reasonableness, um, think of it like this. Whenever you're defending a third party, there's still going to be a reasonableness analysis. Mm-hmm. 
but you're allowed to use as much force as was necessary for that person to act reasonably. So how much uh, force could that person have reasonably used in response to the threat that they were looking at? So just kind of transfer the re- the hypothetical reasonable person to somebody in that third party's condition and that third party's proclivities and age and weight and all that stuff. So just a, just a little nuance point there is that you're not going off of yourself at that point. You're going off of yeah. the attacked party and you can use it to defend that person. You can use as much as they would have been able to yeah. reasonably use. You step in their shoes. That's and right. if they can do it, you can do it on their behalf. You can always defend a third party who you know or don't know. But, you know, when you do this, you are taking a big risk. And so just be aware. If you're going to pull your firearm, and what I like to tell people is you should imagine you're going to be prosecuted. And then I give them a long talk about all of the horrible things that go along with being prosecuted. And I tell them, keep that thought over here. And when you're thinking about pulling out your firearm, say to yourself, I'm going to be prosecuted. Is what is about to happen right now worse than me being prosecuted? If it is, then okay, pull out your firearm. Definitely pull it out at that point. Some examples here are I'm going to be dead. Okay, I'd rather be prosecuted than be dead. I'm going to be really seriously injured here. Okay, I'd rather be prosecuted than really seriously injured. Someone else who I think a lot of or maybe love or like a lot is going to be dead. I'd rather be prosecuted. But as a client once said to me when I asked, why did you pull out your firearm? He said, because I was being disrespected. Would you rather be disrespected or prosecuted? I'd rather be disrespected, to be clear about it. Yeah. And so don't pull out your firearm in that case. You should. It should really be that serious before you pull out your firearm. And you can do that in a split second. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this was a long, uh, very, very detailed video. But you know what, Mark? I'm really glad that we did a deep dive yeah. into this topic mm-hmm. just because it really is what all of our analysis as attorneys is going to. And it's not only in self-defense cases. Reasonableness comes up all the time in so many other cases and crimes that we defend. But particularly for our attorneys on retainer clients who are trying to gauge you know, how to respond to certain situations situations. Reasonableness really is the whole enchilada. It's the whole ball of wax. It's the only thing that matters at the end of the day. And whether a jury thinks you acted reasonably or not could be the difference between years and years, maybe decades of prison. Yeah, if you're not sure about that, check the self-defense statutes in your state. Just get on Google and do a search, self-defense statutes, and put your state in there. You're going to see that word reasonable or reasonableness a lot. A bunch of times. It's all over. It's all about reasonableness. Awesome. Thank you very much for tuning in today, guys. Go and check out attorneysonretainer.us to learn all about our self-defense program and what it can do for you. Also check out attorneysforfreedom.com to learn all about our law firm and our philosophy in defending our clients. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it and subscribe to the channel and share it with a friend. Until next time, this has been Attorney Andy Markintel and Attorney Mark J. Victor. Peace. Peace.